You're listening to the Rule of Life podcast by Practicing the Way. In each season, we explore an ancient practice from the way of Jesus and its relevance for the modern era. This is season four, Solitude. Well, here we are, you guys. Episode three of the Solitude season. Brian, uh, what's been coming up for you over the last few conversations? Yeah, you know, one of the things I remembered is someone was sharing, I think it was you, Bethany, and you reminded me of this, this moment I had in, I was desperately just in nature, trying not to be distracted. Maybe it was you had this conversation. And I heard the birds, and I heard all these external outdoor n- noises, and I was reminded of this, like, bitter control that I had, like, oh, these people are just distracting me. This, these birds are, won't let me just have a moment of stillness. And I'm here <laughs> trying to be intentional. And Lord, you, I want, you're going to speak to me. And I just remember this, like, the way, like, my inner, I just felt this, like, inflation. Were these, like, the nice sounding birds they, or, like, crow, they were, death They cries. were truly, they were beautiful. And yeah. they, but they were just cutting through something in me in that moment. Yeah. And it was just a few minutes. I was really, a, a, like, I was tuned into them too much. And then there was just like this clear, almost like film cinematic break where I, I just heard the beauty that they were producing. And I immediately felt the Lord say, they're just worshiping, just enjoy them. And then this is a maybe more personal, but I had been in this really struggled relationship with my oldest at the time, who's little. She's just consistently bothering me is this feeling I had. She would always interrupt me and I kept having to correct her. And I felt the Lord very gently say to me, she's just doing what I've asked her to be, which is just like full of wonder. Mm -hmm. And I had this moment of like, she's just worshiping. She's just trying to get your attention. And I just had this moment of realization that I'm so busy so frequently. These birds are just doing what they're made to do. My daughter was just doing what she's made to do. And I'm so living up here that I miss it for bothering me as opposed to just enjoyment. And you, one of you said it last time about noise. And I just remembered that it was a few years ago. And it, I need to come back to that because I just, I, I, I love that just a few minutes in that space of nature produced that kind of freedom mm. in me. Mm-hmm. And it changed, I mean, it changed my relationship with my daughter immediately. Like it was so sweet. Mm. I think that's such a good example of what happens in solitude. A, because it's a sign that you were not in control of the experience. Yeah. Like what was happening was not what you wanted. Yeah. And B, you know, rem, you know, John's line last week of, I had a thought. Yeah. Mm. This yeah, thought or whatever it was, right. this thought came to me. It came to me. That's you great, know, yeah. about the Pelicans or whatever. Yeah. This thought came to me. Yeah. And that's so often what happens in solitude. You go in, you don't control it. Yeah. But yet a thought comes or a yeah. feeling comes or a desire comes or an insight or whatever. Um, mm. I feel like that's a really good example. Mm. Mm-hmm. Bethany, we wanted to turn the microphone around, so to speak, and mm. let you kind of hold most of this conversation. Because um, I used this line, I think, in episode one of from Henry Nouwen, mm. where he writes, in the way of the heart, solitude is not a private therapeutic place. Yeah. Mm. It is the place of encounter mm-hmm. where the old self dies and the new self is born. And that's a kind of an abbreviation of a longer quote. But so we kind of built the practice around these three encounters that we often experience when we go into solitude and silence and stillness. That's an encounter with ourselves, an encounter with Mm. our enemy and an encounter with our God. Mm. And so I thought it would be, um, there's no one I would rather talk to more about that first one, an encounter with ourselves than you, Bethany. Mm. I think, you know, you said something recently in a teaching I was sitting under where you we're speaking about how awareness is such a key part of the spiritual life mm. and so much of a function of the practices to yeah. cultivate awareness yeah. of your interiority and from there, you know, all that's outside of us as well. And I found that to be really true and really profound. I always joke, you're the best pastor mm. I know. And what I mean by that, I mean, there's different types of- It's not really of, a joke, right? It's yeah, not I mean, really a joke yeah. at all. <laughs> I think what I mean by that is you mm. have an uncanny ability to read other people's inner lives, not Mm. in a creepy Mm. way. (laughs) And that has to come out of your ability to read your own inner life, which is really a discipline of awareness. Mm. And obviously that's a a key function of solitude is to grow in your awareness Mm. of all things, God Mm -hmm. and of yourself. And those Mm. two things, you know, rise and fall together, all the saints and sages say. But I think I'm thinking here of Jude's, you know, my greatest fear in life is Mm. to be alone. You know, the terror that people feel of solitude. 
I think what people, I think rightly into it and why people fear solitude is because we have to encounter ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've had this experience, especially early on in the practice, where I would go into it just expecting I'm going to feel closer to God <laughs> and I'm going to feel at peace and happy, like away from the stress yeah. of life and no to-do list and no phone and no people to agitate me or get in a fight with or just, just me, just <laughs> me and God. And then you go in and yeah. often it's like out of the frying pan into the fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Thomas Keating has that brilliant insight in the human condition where he writes that often when we come to quiet before God, which is what happens in so many of the practices, not just solitude, the first thing that happens is what he calls the unloading of the unconscious, yeah. which I think is his sophisticated way of saying all the stuff that we push down in the busyness of life yeah. um, and we run away from and we self-medicate with our cultural narcotic of choice when you go into solitude, true solitude, where there's no distraction, no props, nothing to distract you from yourself yeah. or from your God, it's like all that stuff that we push down just starts to come up. Yeah. And then we start to feel all sorts of things that we would often rather not feel. So yeah. I would love to have you speak. Am I, is that a me and Thomas Keating, we're wacko thing? <laughs> or, I mean, does that resonate at yeah. all? At least I'm in good company, right? Yeah. But does that resonate with your experience of solitude at all? Yeah, I mean, a thousand percent. I was just thinking when you were saying that, I thought, yeah, that's a short-lived experience when you're thinking, I'm going to go into solitude and encounter me. You know, where you're feeling like this is going to be blissful or even encounter God in this way that I have ordered it to be in my mind. But uh, that that is very quickly flipped on its head because I think when, and John spoke to this so beautifully too yeah. earlier, but when you enter into that space, stripped down of what you, just like you said, of what you normally use and even subconsciously use to comfort yourself, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. hide from yourself or to hide from God or... Um, to dilute, I mean, like, I know that's a strong word, but to dilute the reality of your pain or your experience of life at the time, when those things come before God, into God's presence, none of it can be hidden. Yeah. So, yes, the chaos of I can't, one, the chaos of the shock of what actually is there yes. begins to emerge. But then also the chaos of I cannot control this. This is, this yeah. is real. This is before me. This is around me. And I think for anyone doing this, that is a natural byproduct is, mm -hmm. you know, earlier I was thinking about the line of wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, I know we say it a lot, but it's true it's in this true. space. It's like solitude. trying to run from ourselves constantly. Yes. Yeah. yes. And when you, when you enter into solitude, stop running, you are there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are there. You are there. And so there's this reality to that that is, I believe, meant to be disruptive hmm. for the purpose of transformation, but doesn't feel that way when we begin the journey. So, I mean, maybe that the mm -hmm. purpose is the thing behind, like, what's the difference between when somebody might may hear, so you go into solitude for an encounter with yourself. Mm -hmm. How is that different from the gospel of self-actualization, the gospel of Peloton, you know, that we are just bombarded with by, yeah. you know, wellness <laughs> capitalism every time we open our phone yeah. where there's a lot of talk about the self mm -hmm. and even a version of self-awareness. Like how, how is this different than that? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think it's simple. I think the answer is really simple. I think in the self-help arena where the self is kind of the focus and we're centered around ourselves and well-being, um, that's the, that is the whole end and beginning. When we come into solitude, the distinction is that the focus is not on self, but on God, and then God on self. Yeah. And so like in the self-help arena, it's all very much oriented to you and your definition of solving the problem, your mm. responsibility to actually- You have all the answers perceive, within yourself. Create. It's yeah, all coming from within without any guide, no real guide except for your own brokenness or your own bent or your own leaning, which never satisfies, which is why they're making so much money. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because There's it's money like, to be made after people it's trying not to working, find themselves. So I keep trying to find it, keep trying to find it. But in solitude, we come 
into the presence of God, and it's then God who begins to speak to self. So it's just, a, in my mind, it's a focus issue. And the gift of that is that, you know, it's not void of God caring about the mm. self, which I think sometimes we think about, like, well, if it's all about God, then it's not about me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not true. That's not true. God cares about yeah, yourself. Yeah, there's something of truth even in the yeah. self-actualization. Yes. It's not all wrong. No, yeah. there's a witness to the character of God, to the nature of God. I'm in thinking that. right now of that as a Bonaventure who had the four stage spiritual development paradigm. And let me see if I can do this off the top of my head. It was love of self. That's where we start. We yeah. all start at love of self. Yeah. And many of us never mature it's beyond true. that. Then I think it was love of God for self. Mm. And then third stage was love of God for God. Mm. Meaning, so second stage, you love God for what you get out of it or how yeah. he makes you feel. Yeah. Third stage of love of God for God. But yeah. then his highest stage of spiritual maturity was love of self for God. Yeah. yeah. And I think that we struggle often to even grasp what that would be like. Yeah. Mm. I think it's interesting, you know, even when you're speaking to that in my mind, I think about how many times I've come into the presence of God and completely dismissed myself from the equation. Yes. And how, if I actually break it down, even in the levels you just spoke to, how that that automatically removes me from the encounter. Yeah. It automatically removes me. So I'm coming in going, I want transformation, but I don't want to be, I'm not in it. Um, so it sounds simple, but when we come to solitude, these are some of the unnamed realities that exist of like, well, I'm, I don't know. Sometimes mm. I don't even know what it means to bring myself to yeah. the equation. I think for some mm. of us, that is one of the obstacles we're starting with in this conversation. It's funny as I hear you, I'm, I'm kind of just thinking of like, first things first, like when in the kingdom, if God is first, he is very happy to make you second. Mm. But if we aim at ourself as the goal, the end goal, act self actualization, or whatever, we tend to miss ourselves, yes. our real whole self, yes. and God. We don't get either. Yeah. And so it's funny as you phrase it. I've not put in that that, or at least that concept in those terms, but it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But one of the things we're talking about is the hard things about ourselves that we have <laughs> often neglected or avoided or abandoned. Why would anyone want to sit to go into science and solitude to sit with those negative emotions? What does that do for a person? Why would they do that? Yeah. Yeah, because it feels often like the first emotions that come up are like the not pleasant ones. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I just hear all the therapists in my head are like, you can't call any emotions (laughs) bad. All emotions need to be honored. They're all useful. And I I get that. And they are. And I agree with that. What I mean is like, I don't know, negative emotions. Apparently, I'm not supposed to say that one either. Unpleasant emotions, unwanted emotions. Um, it feels like those ones often come up first. I mean, mm-hmm. Keating has this whole thing of like, yep. it's your body like processing, I think he calls it undigested emotional yes. pain, Yeah, you know, yeah. before God and with God and in God, you know. I think, you know, Brian, you asked the question, why would anyone want to? Nobody yes. wants to. Yeah. So I just want to say that for all of us out here who are, you know, thinking like, oh, who wants to, you know? I'm just, just in the mood <laughs> yeah. for some undigested you know emotional pain. <laughs> Yeah, I can't wait for my trauma to be exposed. Uh, you know, like those kind of things or the emotions around it. Yeah. Um, but I think that especially, you know, I, I, therapists speak to this all the time. Um, all emotions are good and bringing part of yourself yeah. um, to solitude or to the presence of God for the purpose of encounter will only get you part of um, the transformation that you need. Mm. So wait, wait, you're saying if you bring part of yourself to God, you only get part of your transformation. Yeah. So, so the answer to that is why would I bring, why would I want to sit in the negative emotions? Well, one, the negative emotions bear witness to the fact that you've actually brought your whole self to God. They're a part of mm. who you which are. Which is the greatest act of worship mm. and surrender we can do as, as people who follow Jesus. But also it affords you the opportunity to, to have the greatest encounter. Mm. Yeah which is what we're all after. And it feels counterintuitive, you know, when the negative emotions arise and I can't speak, you know, yeah. I'm not a therapist nor the daughter of a therapist, but I can't speak to the fact, you know, that why negative emotions surfaced first. I think I can at least just attest in my own life that it's because they're the most in need of God's healing. Hmm. <laughs> they're the most acute actually yeah. within me when those things are stripped away. So that makes sense to me, at least in the kingdom. But, you know, I think there's a, I don't know. There's a greater invitation to receive um, from the Lord in the broadest way when we come 
open, when we yeah. come with the emotions that we can't categorize, that we can't um, fully understand the root of or the power of in our lives and allow him to actually govern those. Mm. So mm. I think what bringing your whole self, those negative emotions does for you is it tells you the whole story. Mm. It gives the opportunity for God to tell the whole story about what's going on in your life and your own transformation. And it gives the spirit an opportunity to heal you. And that's the purpose of encounter with God. The only way we're transformed or changed is if we're able to bring to God the things that need the most transformation and healing. Mm. So the other thing I would name here is that I think that, and I was starting this thought earlier, just now coming back to me. That's how the brain's working this afternoon. But <laughs> um, is that, you know, we often see these as obstacles to actual encounter. At least that's what I do when I Your come. Your emotions. Yeah, the, the na particularly the negative emotions. Like I'm here, I want to encounter God, and I'm just mad at somebody that yeah. hurt me, and I'm just mm. thinking about it. Yeah, and I'm wounded, yeah. and I don't feel comforted, and I feel, I feel far from God in some of those spaces. Yes. Like it just feels like space or absence, or I feel like you didn't defend me, God, yeah. or whatever it is my perspective is. And we often see those as the greatest obstacles mm. to encounter or the greatest times to avoid solitude you know, to avoid encounter with God. And yet what we see, what we know, and you've said this a million times, a million different ways, John Mark, is that our greatest places of pain are the places of our greatest healing and transformation, mm. which I have been saying, but that the point is, this is the actual catalyst for it. Like you, we want these, we look at these opportunities and go, they're just too hard. It's they're actually obstacles to my transformation, but they're actually the entrance into actual communion and healing with Jesus. Mm, pain is. Pain is. Pain is the, you know, Pete Scazzaro says this all the time. Pain is the stimulus. It's the the quantifier yeah. of the, the fact that something needs to be healed. Something, mm. in other words, needs God's attention. And something outside of you, outside of how you can perceive it, needs to happen in order for you to receive freedom mm. from that. So rather reality. than running away from it, we need to run through the pathway of it. Towards it. Yeah. So, to you know, God. pain usually um, wants to push you outward. Yeah. You know, it wants to push you up and out. I don't know why I just sounded like I was on the side of a cotton field right there, but <laughs> it pushes you up and out um, usually because you, you want to run. The south. Yes. It's just in you. You want to run from it. Mm. But the invitation in a space like solitude um, especially in the presence of God, is to go inward and downward. Yeah. That's the invitation, mm. is to actually stay with it long enough to let God bring you to a place where there's a deeper, a different understanding. Yeah, a question I just have to ask you, Bethany, and I don't know what you will say, but it seems to me, and I, I continue to think this more and more with each passing year, I just observe so much denial yeah. As a coping strategy for pain. Yeah. And, you know, my therapist said to me recently, he's brilliant. He said, denial is the most popular and most effective of all pain coping strategies. Mm. And you just see it all over. Yeah. But there's a unique problem, I think, in the church, if you want to call it that, or Christian mm. spirituality. You know, John Woolman called it spiritual bypassing, mm. which is just a great yeah. phrase. Yeah where you attempt to use spiritual ideas, doctrines, language, yeah. sayings to basically skip around, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with unhealed wounds from your childhood mm -hmm. or important psycho-spiritual development or maturity. And I see an extraordinary amount of spiritual bypassing mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. church at large where people use really good language of God. And it often sounds very Christian, yeah. very... Mm -hmm biblical, very mm -hmm. pious. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. like, nobody wants to like push back on that. Mm -hmm. You know, well, it's just about hope in God or yeah. like, yes, yes, that is true. But you just are, went through an extraordinary tragedy. You need to, I mean, yeah. read the Psalms and they yeah. are not doing spiritual bypassing yeah. Yeah. at all. They're doing like, holy cow, is this, are you allowed to read this? Yeah. Not much less, <laughs> I feel guilty that. for yeah. reading some of the yeah. Psalms, much less praying some of them, you know? Yeah. So, Obviously, denial is not the strategy at play in the Psalms, not the strategy in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus, mm. uh, especially upon a close inspection of Jesus' prayer. But I guess the question there is, I just see so many, I saw it the other day, somebody I was 
working with wonderful person, lovely Jesus person, and a hopeful person by personality, but I could just watch this person talking themselves out of their pain. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's really nothing compared to whatever. Ah, oh, I have these good things in my life. And and it's like, who wants to dis I don't want to critique that and mm-hmm. be like, yeah, you do. But actually, <laughs> but you should be sad this right is now. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm I'm watching like yeah. good kind of Christian behaviors of gratitude and hopefulness, mm-hmm. but they're actually masking, mm-hmm. man, there's a real pain here that you need to attend to, not to wallow in your pain, but so that Jesus can do the work of healing. So the question embedded in that little rant <laughs> um, is what do you say at a pastoral level yeah. to people that would rather utilize spiritual bypassing or denial or Christian language rather than use their pain as a portal to God. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if I were sitting across from someone that I was pastoring, um, I would say, how is it working for you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I'm yeah. totally honest, I would say, you know, I think about even this example you just used, and even the speed at which you described how they were talking about how good they're doing or how well they're doing uh, feels like more like anxiety than peace. Yeah. And so I think the, the mm. question we all have to hold, and, and it's not this person or even people who are really good at spirit, spiritual bypassing, but all of us who could yeah. do this, especially those of us who are professional Christians, <laughs> um, is to say, well, are you, are you at peace with God? Are you at peace with God and self? Are you a person, a non-anxious presence? Yeah. Are you at rest? And the reason, I mean, it's a simple question, but it's a provocative question. It's a genuinely provocative question meant to reveal what's to reveal what's working and what's not working. And I don't know. I think pastorally, I come back to that question a lot. Is like, well, what's the goal? If the goal is to like manage or mitigate right now, mm. you're doing it. If it's pain management, yeah, and, and that's and, an effective strategy. And doing it in the name of Jesus. And sometimes, very rarely, and again, I'm not a therapist. Sometimes, people need to wait a moment before yes. going deeper, or they need yeah. other people to go with them. There's there is room for that for sure in this yeah. space. Um, no, that is very wise. Yeah, but but for most of us, it's you know that is a form of our avoidance. Yeah. That is a, in the name of Jesus, using the name of Jesus to bypass what he, in his even creation of you and how you're meant to be on the Mm. earth. It's a bypassing of the gift he's given you of communion, the gift of relationship with him. And, you know, it moves God into an objectified space, not a relational space. Wow. And so I would just say, you know, are, is there, you know, I would say it so much more winsomely pastorally, but. Um, <laughs> no, I think you said that. Yeah. But, but you were yeah. thinking about pain. That's brilliant. So you're yeah. saying if your goal is pain management. Yeah. I just don't want to feel too bad. Yeah. Then unless if the trauma is overwhelming. Yeah. Just utilize denial works great. Just keep yeah. going. If you just want to yeah. manage the pain. If that's what you want to do. And you can stay above the happiness yeah. line. And. Okay. Is it sin? I don't know. That's yeah. between you and the Lord, because that's where hmm. some of us could go, you know. But if you want, well, to- I don't know that it is sin, but I think it causes sin. Yeah. yeah, I think sin comes out of that space, unhealed space in all of us. Yeah, and that's where you're saying. But if your goal is union, yes, and transformation, yeah. yes, then you have to go down. Then you have the path. to. You have to relate. Yeah. To oh, the to the being who created you, and like, you have to relate. Who you actually are, yeah. all that yes. you actually are, not your ego, not who you want to be or wish you were, but you. Yes. Because if you say back to God the things you've been using to manage your pain, yeah, I think very quickly he'll have a response to all of those things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, at least in my knowledge of yeah. him, he's usually like, oh, but, th-. and I do it. So, so I'm, I'm guilty of it. I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm just saying sometimes I'll say to God like, yes, but you're faithful. And he'll be like, but everything in your heart yeah. right now wants to curse me. Yeah. So. So either I can stay, and he is faithful, and there's yeah. truth in what I'm speaking out. But the the relational aspect is he's saying, I want you to tell me what you actually think, yeah. and I will lead you to the place where you will know my faithfulness. Mm. But that's very different yes. than just naming Pain something, management. Speaking and, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I, I don't do it much, but when I uh, 
give spiritual direction, one of my favorite questions to start with is just where does it hurt? Mm -hmm. And I think because I've been so deeply influenced by a much older um, view of the atonement of just the healing of the soul Mm -hmm. and, you know, all based on lots of things, but in particular, Jesus, it's not the health you have need of a doctor, um, but the sick. And he, you know, calls himself the the physician and likens sin to like a disease of the soul and all the, you know, ancient Christians called Jesus, the doctor of the soul. Mm-hmm. Uh, Keating calls him the divine therapist, <laughs> you know, which is a little Keating ish, but it's still beautiful. Yeah. But the doctor of the soul. So, I mean, I think I imagine what if you wanted a relationship with a doctor and you came in and you're super sick, but he's like, Hey, I, I want to help you. I want to heal you. Where does it hurt? You're like, no, no, I'm okay. Other people have it way worse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's just go That's walking. Exactly it. Yep. You're like, well, okay, but <laughs> you're dying and I, I'm a doctor, you know, and you're missing yeah. union and transformation. If you're like, I don't need to go see the doctor, I'm okay. Yeah. Rather than saying, I'm not okay, I need to go see the yeah. doctor. Yeah. You know? And you don't know the realities, you know, when you're sick, you don't even remember always how, how it feels to be well. Yeah. We get so used to being we sick. Get so used to it. So the same concept to wow. me, transfer, it's like, at some point, you will become numb to the reality of the gift of healing, the gift of, of being healed and brought deeper in. Um, and that's what's at stake when mm-hmm. it comes to that. I also think there's, you know, you may your interior experience of it may not be the best judge of how manageable it is. Yeah. A better judge is how in relationship it's expressed because nine times out of ten if someone is denying their pain, their inability to sit with loved ones' pain mm. or friends' pain mm-hmm. yes. or to overdo. I think we it's a bizarre place where we live in a time where people overdo their pain yeah. Yeah. and the trauma of their story. Like, yeah. And then a know, lot of us often react against that. Exactly. I'm not going to be that exactly. person. It's just everything's about my pain. So then everything's you spend, about my family of origin. So we have the, we have, I think it's very rare to find someone who like appropriately names it yeah. in its appropriate place. No, the Lord is bigger. No, like, Absolutely, it will not over. I am bigger than my emotions. Mm-hmm. I am bigger, right? That um, Laird has that great image of you being mm-hmm. the mountain and your anxiety being the weather that passes over you. Yes, yes. It, love it's a that. beautiful mm-hmm. image. I think I think anxiety actually keeps a lot of people from that space mm-hmm. because it's not even the pain that they're unaware of. It's the anxiety that they feel that is so embodied, they're afraid of it getting heightened. Afraid of triggered. feeling that. Yeah. Yeah. And... So much of our of our decision making is just trying Mitigating, to avoid yeah. feelings we don't want. Yeah. Yes. You know? And I think for you said it so well. It's like that's not real. Like often when I'm kind of being flippant with people, I'll be like, when you pr- pray pretend prayers, you only pray to a pretend God. Mm. And it's like my joke hand way of saying, of course God can sit with exactly where you're at. But there's something about that. He's over here saying, Will you be who I see you as? Yeah. Can you come to this depth? It will be a, a natural place of whole withholding intimacy, not mm. by him, but by your unwillingness to go with him. Yeah. And I think if we're going to sit here and say, we want to move in, in and up, we want to, or de- down, as you're saying, then it's like, okay, I want to be willing to let as I'm capable in this season of going. And yeah. I think there's such a gentleness. I've, I've experienced mm. very painful things that have come up in my times of silence and solitude, but nine times out of 10, they're met with such tenderness yeah. and healing on the other side of yes. it that I, whatever fear I have that it'll be overwhelming is met so quickly with the grace of God Yes, that, oh, actually... The fear doesn't map to reality. You're big enough to handle all yeah. of this. And actually, yes. I'm big enough to handle this because you're with me. Yeah. yeah, And that's where true friendship for me in prayer became... Like, prayer didn't become real for me really until I began to experience silence and solitude. And those mm. real things in me were able yeah. to be named. Yep. And I mean, like, my first day in silence and solitude... The first R-rated images came up to my head, came to my mind. And I had friends and mentors who said that might come up. Yeah. And it's just things living beneath you that you didn't even know. The were primal stuff. Yeah. It's so yeah. primal. And and then you realize how, how it's impacted your ability to relate and connect deeply. And for me, that's the drive. It's mm-hmm. like, well, if, if spiritual formation is growth and love, then, man, I want to be someone. I want you to deal with anything that prevents me from growing in love. Yeah. So whatever that looks like, if that's my pain in this season, let's deal with it. I want you to name it. I'll go for it. You know, yeah. and if it's my my temper, my anger, mm-hmm. my habits, my whatever, please, I want you to be able to name it with me. And this is where community is essential for that as yeah. the other side of solitude. 
Sorry, yeah. I'm rambling now. No, no it's, it's great. Re- it's funny how we have to come away from relationship relationship in order to be in yes yeah. healthy relationship. It's oh, I mean tangent, but you know, I think it's now. And I remember being in college and reading Living Reminder, mm-hmm. and he has this beautiful thing to pastors. But it's so good for relationships that relationships only become real when they're remembered. So you need distance to have time to reflect on it mm. so that then it becomes real. Because when you're constantly and mm. chronically just engaged, there's no distance to say, oh, what, is this, what does this person really mean to me? And where are our patterns of relationship oh, healthy? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, oh. you know, one of the things you're naming, we all know this, you know, if there's such a generational divide around, let's say, therapy. Yeah. You know, especially yeah. in the yes. Christian tradition. You know, for some people, it's like, anathema yeah <laughs> you know like to i know certain people that are you know several decades older than me yeah. might as well just say you became a satanist as like <laughs> yeah. you know um huh? going to a therapist for another generation it's like yeah. more important than yeah the gospel of jesus mm-hmm. you know and at least early on long as people stay in it they yeah. realize mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't work as well as we all want to yeah. believe yeah. it does you know and we come back to to grace but hmm. i think one of the rightful corrections from our generation and our kids' generation, and it's an overcorrection. That's that's how it inevitably goes. Yeah. Is I think the realization that often our, you know, you could say our wickedness is tied to our woundedness. Mm-hmm. If you just wanted to use two W's, you know. <laughs> Which I always want to. If maybe I mean, you just finished yeah. writing a book and you had W's that are hard, in there, but, you know, and uh-huh. you're like, hey, that, that writes well. You know, I'm saying it out loud. I'm realizing it sounds really cheesy. Sounds but good. It, I love it, it. It felt good in the book. But, you know, our wickedness is tied mm-hmm. to our woundedness. And it, well, I think that's just a way of saying so much of my unhealthy, ungodly ways of relating to people yeah. that are unloving are are rooted in unhealed wounds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's not to play the victim. That's not to blame anyone. Mm-mm. It's to say, hey, I, I, I'm living with this unhealed wound. I, I need healing in order to become the person of love yeah. that I want to be. I mean, so many. I mean, I could just, I could literally almost connect the dots between every repeating unhealthy patterns I have with my oldest 17 year old son and something mm. in me that yeah. Jesus is still on the yeah. process of healing that yeah. goes back. Some of it goes back to family of origin. Some of it goes back to last summer, just life, you mm-hmm. know? And so I think, you know, I think it's a David Benner who in the gift of being yourself says, he's a psychologist. He says, Freud was wrong about pretty much everything. <laughs> But one thing he was right about was it's the things that we refuse to acknowledge about ourselves that have the most power. Yeah. Yes. So when we mm-hmm. utilize denial, um, we're actually letting like the monster grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're letting this thing that we're scared to face, we're actually let it, we're giving it more yeah. power yeah. to sabotage our growth into love. So mm-hmm. I feel like what solitude does is it arrests that inevitable process and yeah. it makes you face the monster. Yeah. And again, the fear does not map to reality. I, I can get so scared of it and then you do it. You're like, yeah. no, the yeah. fear just disappears into thin air when you're there with God. Yeah, yeah. It's fear that keeps us from going mm. there. Yeah. You know? I think too, to your point, like I, both of your points, actually, I just keep thinking about how even in this space of entering in, how you experience the kindness of Jesus, I think in a way, that you don't often, even in the other disciplines, get to experience him because you have to yield control. So he is leading yeah. you in a different way. But even beyond that, even as we're even thinking about, you know, the immenseness sometimes of how our wounds or pain or whatever it is that we're carrying is impacting us and the relationships around us. What I have found to be so true in this experience, even when I'm like, God, it just feels like impossible that you could touch this and it would be hmm. better and I would leave here changed is that God is able, if I'm, if I'm able to bring my whole self to him, is he is in this space of solitude, able to lead me to places I could never go, yeah. which then affords me the liberty and relationship to other people to go to places I would never go mm. or be able to go. Wow. So I just, I think it's important to name, even as we're talking about this, he is a, he will welcome you. He's a hospitable God who cares for us and knows how to woo us into that place mm. as we yield. But he also will take us to places far beyond what we could perceive or even know that we need hmm. in the space of solitude if we're willing. And then that is that byproduct continues. I mean, that's the, I don't know if we can use this language, that's the drug for me. Yeah. Is yeah. I'm like, I've experienced that enough to know that. Yeah. This might sound like a really healing. silly question, but how do you define success? Yeah. Mm. Again, forgive the, I know 
disclaimer. It's kind of a silly <laughs> question, but how do you how it's do America, you find it's America, man? We're all <laughs> it's about America. it. America. How, how do you define success? And you go you go into a practice. Yeah, it's a practice of not doing more than of doing. Mm-hmm. You can't control it. All sorts of afflictive emotions come up that mm-hmm. you don't want. Yeah. Yeah. Ha- and sometimes you have an encounter with God and other times you mm-hmm. don't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ha- what is success? <laughs> um, this is just my definition. So, um, you know, take it for what it's worth. But I think the definition of success in silence and solitude is that you continue to do it. <laughs> Period. Sure. I mean, I know that sounds really yeah. simple, but um, continuing to do it pushes against the consumer mm. aspect of Christian faith, where if I come to God's presence, I need to take something out or I need to have some kind of transformative yeah. experience for it to be quantified to it a metric, as yeah, like yeah, a, totally. a valuable part of my life. But I think success is just continuing to do it even when it doesn't, you don't feel like it, even when. Um, you can't perceive what you're going to get out of it yeah. or even name what you want to get out of it. I think the success is showing up and saying, even as an act of worship, and I've just, I've, I really feel like I've moved into this space where I'm saying it is right and good for me, mm-hmm. like David said, to be in the, to be in the presence of God, to be where he is. And this discipline, if it's nothing else than me mm. saying, I am here, here, yeah. If that is not central, like even John said earlier, to my life, like, then what am I doing? You know, what what am I going after? So yeah. I think success is that. And then I will say, like, in this, I just think it's important to say, most of the time, even when you don't feel like you're being transformed, you probably are yeah. just by the discipline of showing up to in my it. experience is the times when I feel like I'm being untransformed, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you know, yes. that are often the times of my greatest growth in hindsight. It's you know? true. Yeah. It's true. And others will see that there's, there's usually a, some kind of reverb that begins to happen as you keep coming into the presence of God this way, keep becoming undone before Jesus, keep bringing your whole self broken, mm. floppy, wiggly, whatever it is. Yeah. There's something to that, mm. that I think, is so God centered yeah. and not us centered that it can and it will inevitably have an impact. It will inevitably begin to shape the yeah, world. We're that you're really in. far from Project Self at this yeah. point. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 Laird, I hear you quoted earlier, Martin Laird, has written some goofy things and some really yeah. helpful things at the same time. But <laughs> he has that line, you know, breakthroughs come from breakdowns. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think when you're in a breakdown, mm-hmm. when you're in emotional pain, when you're in grief, loss, you feel like you're falling apart. Yeah. And I've, you know, and you feel like mm-hmm. we've been through a couple of really hard years in our family. Yeah. I just, I feel like I'm regressing in my spiritual formation. Yeah. And imagine doing that when your job is teaching on <laughs> yeah. spiritual formation. There's a shadow position. I, I can imagine that a little bit. <laughs> and I feel that way, <laughs> tough. but my wife yeah. doesn't. That's yeah. the interesting thing, who has mm. a different vantage point. Yeah. You know mm. what I mean? So often these times when we are falling That's apart, good. we're coming apart. Yeah are actually the times when mm-hmm. now Jesus is coming in yep. to do the work of healing, to do the the rebuilding mm-hmm. work, yeah. you know, of a soul. Yeah. And so often we get in the moment, we just feel like we're falling apart. But then a year later, we're like, oh, actually, yep. that was like the moment of my liberation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I grew. I didn't become perfect then, but yeah. I grew a lot. Yeah. And this area that I could not get past through my failure Success came, yeah. You know, One, in the true sense of that word. Yeah. I feel like sometimes it, it really is falling apart, and part of that is like the facade. I know from I'll speak to my experience, not yours. Like, there is a falling apart, and you feel like you're going to come apart. And what really does come undone is the projected yeah. lies that you have about the who self God I is, want to believe I am, or about yes. who I, yeah, who I think I've carefully, I've, I've done such a good job of protecting it that I've started to believe it. Yeah. And when that starts to crack. And other people have started. To yeah, it. exactly. Um, you know, this this isn't as I, when I think of ways that I've noticed. It's not really a measure of success, but things I've noticed in myself as I've done Sans Solitude more. Um, one of the ways I do notice a change is not how enjoyable or unenjoyable mm-hmm. the time is, or how profound it feels, or not. But I will say I've noticed over time that um, 
it's like a heart test. Jonathan Sachs has that mm. great metaphor where like when you want to tell us the health of someone's heart, it's not about mm. can they run at sustained levels forever. It's how quickly once they've risen to this mm. threshold, do mm. they come back to baseline? Yeah. Oh, interesting. And I find that I can usually tell the general health of my soul that when I come to a moment of quiet, no matter how frantic I get or how distracted I get during that time, how quickly I can return to stillness. Yes. Yeah. And it's almost like I can mark As a that. measure of your health. Yeah, as like a measure of like, like I may not be enjoying this, but I've noticed my mind quieting faster. Yeah. yeah. My heart and breathing stills faster. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now one talks about this way of the heart. It's like they, Anthony was in the desert for 20 years and carried his 20 years of solitude into his being with others. Yeah. And I love that image that we carry our solitude because yeah. it's a posture. We come in with a posture. You have a practice but then you leave with a new posture. Mm -hmm. And I really think that's really important. Like for me, that's been a, a, a powerful change in the way I notice. I know that whether I can face everything at one moment or not, I know that I leave and I probably am tuning into my family a little bit more, mm. into myself. Yeah. And when I get heated with my kids, I return a little quicker to baseline. Yeah. yeah that's good. And there's something about that that I, it's not even in the time that I notice it. It's other times that mm -hmm. I notice it. So anyway. But it's such slow yeah. work, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's slow yes. work. I mean, I wish you oh. could just go do this two or three times and you're like, got it. I'm now <laughs> Christian Zen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I'm mad at my kids all the time right now. This line, <laughs> <laughs> there's this line I love from St. Seraphion, uh, acquire inner peace mm. and a thousand souls around you shall be saved. Mm. Yeah. I meditate on this line a lot. Wait, say it one more time. Acquire inner peace mm. and a thousand souls around you mm. will be saved. Mm. And I, I, some uh, spiritual director gave that to me many years ago, and I feel it's part of what I'm to pray for my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is hilarious if you know me, because I am like anxious to the core. I'm like <laughs> the opposite of that. Um, but that's a spiritual journey, huh? Like yeah. where vice becomes virtue, where yes. your your shadow becomes mm. God's light in you. Mm. But it takes a long time. Anyway, I was just reading reading Father Jacques Philippe, and he has that quote in there, mm. which I'd read a lot of times. I've read the book that it comes from. And he, then he gives the bio of the saint who said that. And he's like, yeah, he was 16 years a monk, then 16 years a hermit, and then it was like 16 years in a cave or something like that. <laughs> just and at the end, he acquired not, inner peace. Yeah. <laughs> not and I was like, wait, what? Can I just read the book? And, you know. Uh, I think you could do it in 10, 10, and 10, John Mark. Totally That's easy. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> we shave off some time. Efficiency. We're Americans. Uh, We're all yeah, about exactly. efficiency. True. So, I mean, I just think the point there is just... It's beautiful. It's slow work. Yeah. yeah. Bethany, to close us out, what direction would you give for somebody mm -hmm. who... You know, we don't always go into solitude and feel pain. Sometimes we just come yeah. in, we just feel tired and we sleep. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. we come in and just feel gratitude and joy mm -hmm. and energy for God and dreams and desires in our hearts coming up and mm -hmm. prayer. It's beautiful. And we hear the Spirit speaking so loudly. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah. And again, we're not in control. Yeah. Um, and that's beautiful. But for those that may have an intuition that, hey, I'm I'm carrying pain in my mm. body right now. Yeah. Um, mm. and I know that if I go into solitude and I stop running, mm -hmm. that pain is going to catch up with me. Mm -hmm. Um, if you were that hypothetical person that is all of us on a regular basis, how what direction would you give? How would you hold mm -hmm. silence before God and hold your pain before God in the silence? Yeah. You know, I think uh, in my head, I, even as you were just asking that, I thought, oh, what is the, what is the most constructive, mm -hmm. brilliant <laughs> way to say that? Um, but even as we've been talking in this time and we've just been holding this space with God here with us, I've been thinking so much about just the gift of being honest with God and the gift of of even when I know pain, and I this is I'm at that place today. I know I'm mm. carrying pain in my body, and I know that when I go back to my hotel tonight, I have a meeting with God. I have a space that we need to enter into. Mm. The the breath prayer I've been praying throughout this whole day is, um, I am in pain, mm. and being able just to say that to God. Yeah, I I can't unpack all of it. Yeah. And in fact, I've learned enough from solitude to not, to know mm. better than mm. to do that, but to start very small with mm. the most honest phrase I can begin with. 
And that gives me permission Mm. to come as I am. So I want to say something brilliant, and there's a lot of thoughts around this, but the first thing I would just say is be honest. And in that, there is a wonderful acknowledgement of your limits and your humanity. Mm. And sometimes we go, well, that's work for the sages like John Mark and Brian to do. Yeah, nobody's thinking but, that, by the way. But, <laughs> nope. but, but it's not. And if you're like, well, that, I've never done that before, or I've never, I would just say, be as honest as you can in one sentence with yeah. God and let that be your prayer mm. as you enter in. Mm. And if, even if it is, I am. Let your pain af- be your prayer. Let your pain be your prayer. Even mm. if it is, I am afraid. I am afraid of what this means. I, I really believe that's the starting point for so much of this and so much of your submission mm. and welcome to the presence of God to come and do and attend and care for you. Yeah. 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 Well, Bethany, thank you for yeah. your thoughts. And not that that was not brilliant, but I, I don't think we need brilliance because none of us are brilliant when we're in pain. We're all just in survival <laughs> mode. True. We need like, pray your pain. Okay, I, I yeah. can do that. Yeah. I, I'm just, sometimes it's the simple acts that just hold such yeah. extraordinary power. It's true. Just naming your pain before God, yeah. mm-hmm. you know? And then again, we're just thrust. Yeah before God's mercy. We can't fix our pain. We can't heal our pain. Mm. We can't deny our way out of our pain once it, once it crosses a certain threshold. Yeah. But we can pray it. Yeah. You know? So thank you mm. for that. I've learned so much from you, Bethany, over the years about noticing and naming mm. all the emotions, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and not just as a way to feel better, um, but as a way to open to God in a yeah. greater way. So thank you all of you for listening. We're mm-hmm. so grateful for you. Thanks to The Circle and your generosity to make this possible. If you want to find out more about the solitude practice or the work that's all tied to this, you can go to practicingthewayorg But Bethany, would you just close in prayer? Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking of people listening right now as they're mm-hmm. going about their day and that pain is coming up even now yeah you know and there's like the pain pain suppression (laughs) nope 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 they've got five more hours yeah Yeah. would you just maybe if you're listening maybe just let it simmer at Mm -hmm. the surface Mm -hmm. and let it just kind of hold it there before god gently bethany would you pray over us Mm -hmm. so may you know jesus deeply as you wait on him in silence and stillness and in solitude And may you know the gift of his bigness in light of your limits, your fragile humanity. And may you welcome more and more the gift of your true self, whole and alive in the presence of God, being transformed into his likeness for his glory. Amen.